Hello and welcome to this uh, special program on City Channel Pittsburgh, the final interview, at least for City Channel, with Mayor Bill Peduto. Uh, Mayor, you're the only guest. Welcome to the program. <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> um, so I've known you long enough to know that you're an amateur, if not professional, historian. You know everything there is to know about the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, and I've seen you talk about it any number of times. How do you think historians will view your eight years as mayor? Um, I think it will be viewed as sort of like a bridge. You know, that there was uh, an era of time that Pittsburgh fell. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was lucky enough to be a kid in the 1970s, and it was a pretty glorious time period. You know, you, you have four Super Bowls, you have two World Series, an NCAA championship with Pitt, and an economic boom of the steel industry. Pittsburgh was the third largest corporate center of the United States, New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and then, boy, did we fall hard. I mean, 1980s, uh, uh, by 1983, the steel collapse was uh, in full force. I was graduating high school. Uh, by 1987, you couldn't find a job in the city. Um, and then in the 1990s, um, you know, the young people were just leaving. Uh, neighborhoods that uh, we now see uh, phases of gentrification in Lawrenceville and East Liberty were hollowed out. Uh, people were leaving for far different reasons. They were leaving because of the crime and the 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 blight um, and we we slowly started to pick ourselves around around 2000 and pick ourselves up 2000 2005 but i think that what you saw was the the turn uh happened during uh this past decade and during this past decade you saw really a transformation occur within the city of pittsburgh um, a new economy uh, that was based off of education and medicine and technology uh, took over for that old economy that was based upon uh, manufacturing. Uh, you saw a rebirth uh, around um, a green economy uh, and a belief that although we can treasure our past that we didn't have to be dependent upon it uh, we saw a belief in the city uh, that its image could be viewed differently and that we could shed that smoky city image once and for all. And you saw uh, a change in the very character of the city where uh, the old dodgy image of the politics of a uh, backroom dealing city was transformed to a progressive city uh, where youth were no longer going away from the city of Pittsburgh, but actually moving to the city of Pittsburgh. And the backroom dealing uh, politics was transformed into a place where uh, socially active youth now controlled the table. So historians may view your uh, two terms as mayor in terms of professionalizing the city, stopping the backroom dealing, uh, making it as it should be. Were, was there a lot of backroom dealing going on when you first got here, and how did you fix that? The police chief was in jail, John. <laughs> um, there were economic deals being done, and there were only a handful of developers that would even enter into the city of Pittsburgh to do any type of land transition. Now there's countless developers from all over the country uh, that are developing in the city of Pittsburgh and they understand that it is no longer a closed market, uh, but a very open and very open process. Um, we have been able to bring companies in from all over the world uh, and to be able to not simply kick the tires on the city of Pittsburgh, but to invest nearly $12 billion over the course of the past eight years into the city 
um, and to be able to do so in creating markets that didn't exist eight years ago, uh, especially around AI and robotics. And we're at, right now we're at the very cusp of seeing that same type of booming market occur within life sciences and within medicine. And that it is going beyond uh, the UPMCs and the Allegheny Health Networks, but really being born out of the University of Pittsburgh. So what we did within city government is we simply got rid of the old boy network. We, we worked to be able to say to anybody out there who is willing to listen that Pittsburgh is a city that is not for sale, but it's a city that is open for business. This has got to feel somewhat liberating for you. This, I know you enjoyed being there very much, but a lot of responsibility off your back all of a sudden. And it also must feel just kind of weird because you spent a lifetime in public service from being a city council aide to a city council person to two term mayor. It's exactly how it feels. <laughs> so. I, I, I would say that it is uh, far from depressing. Uh, there, you know, I, I still want, you know, as we sit here today, there's less than two weeks, uh, and I'm still getting the, you know, leaves in the uh, catch basin uh, type of requests on a daily basis, and I'm just going 11 days, 11 days. <laughs> So, um, but at that same time, you know, I've, it's more of an anxiety, sort of like the Shawshank Redemption, can I survive outside of prison? You know, you? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> you know. Uh, Peduto was here, you know. <laughs> I, I sort of like, uh, I, I, I worry about, you know, uh, the comfort of uh, this building uh, on a very, very personal note, it's, you know, 27 years in less than two weeks, I'll be walking outside of this building. It's within the next few days that I'll be sitting around with family on Christmas without one member of my immediate family to share Christmas with. Yeah, you lost your mother and two brothers? During the time of these past eight years, yeah. And at that same time, it, it's less than a week that I'll be putting that childhood house that I grew up in on the market. And that's a lot of transition to take on in the course of a few days. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be facing all of that um, within days and starting an entire new career at that same time. So um, there's, that's a lot of anxiety, more so than looking back with uh, some sort of uh, sentimental viewpoint. And so I'm more worried about how I'm going to approach the new life than the loss of what had been. So when you say starting a new career, does that mean uh, you have some idea of what you might be doing, or is that like a blank slate now? You'll be exploring all sorts of options. No, no, no. I, I, I have uh, a good idea of what I'll be doing. I'll, I'll, I'll make it more clear once the rest of my staff has had the opportunity to say what they're going to be doing. Um, earlier this week, uh, my chief of staff, Dan Gilman, announced that he will be the senior advisor and then the chief of staff to President Gormley at uh, Duquesne University. Uh, I still have a few other key administrative uh, people who will be making their announcements over the course of the next 10 days of what they'll be doing. And once they've been uh, making their announcements, then I'll, I'll be the last to announce. Um, that being said, uh, I will be staying in Pittsburgh for at least one year. Uh, I have talked to folks in Washington. Uh, there's nothing imminent uh, during 2022. 
So, you know, I'll be looking to uh, make an announcement about uh, consulting work that I'll be taking on. Well, there's a clue, consulting work. Mm -hmm. um, so what will, you, what will you miss most about the job? Uh, you know, there's something special about being a mayor, and I, I hope that part of it doesn't leave, actually. It's, it's the difference between sort of being a staffer or an unrecognizable city council member and walking into the building and standing there as you're on the other side of the metal detector and you'll see somebody and they'll have that giant eagle bag, that, that blue bag filled with papers yeah. and they're rustling through it trying to figure out where they're supposed to go and you'll look at them and say, can I help you? And they're like, I have to go to the tax office, I don't know where to go. And you'll say, you need to go to finance, it's on the second floor, take this elevator over here. When you get off, just make a right, you'll see the double door, just go out. And they'll say, okay. And when you walk through the same place, they're 20 some years, and you see that same person ruffling through, and you say, can I help you? And they're like, I need to go to the tax office. You're the mayor. <laughs> and they smile at you. And a smile's contagious. And you immediately smile back. And it doesn't matter if it's there or if it's in a corporate boardroom and people don't know what to do and they all stand up when you come in or it's in a church basement or it's, it's, it's a, it doesn't matter where it is. There's something that is so much different when you're the mayor than when you're a city council member, or a state representative, a state senator, or whatever the office is. There's, there's some reverence that's given to mayors, governors, you know, to, and it just, when somebody smiles at you, it automatically makes you smile back. And it is a reward within itself that takes away from all the negativity, all the vile things that are said on social media, all the negativity on the comment sections and the radio talk shows and all that other stuff that's out there. It's like the light that shines through it and makes it all the world of difference. I know I've tried to get you for years to stop reading the comment sections. Uh, <laughs> is, is that still... Uh something you're able to do? Can you not read the comment sections or do you still constantly rifle through them? I don't know how to read the comment sections anymore. I, I think they like blocked them or I somehow have blocked them out of my uh, ability to see them. I, I, I don't know. I, I just don't see them anymore. But I still read the Twitter. So Yeah, that's, that can be rough as well, yeah. yeah. But I, 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 I found that blocking people uh, on Twitter, not blocking, not, not erasing them. They're not blocking, I guess. Muting them. Muting them, sorry, different t term. So they can still read my stuff, but then when they start screaming back and nah, 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 it's just like, what? <laughs> I, can't, I can't hear you. Yeah. Is that pretty much what you hear when you could hear them? Nah, 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 nah. That's what it sounded like, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, what's the best perk about being mayor? I know you got a great parking spot. That's it. Oh, that's it. Yeah. I'm going to miss that bus, bus lane, man. That was just, it's like right to my house. Seriously. It's, you know, I, I could like get from my house to my workspace in seven minutes, you know, and I love sleep. So it would be like snooze, boop, snooze, <laughs> snooze. Five minutes late. <laughs> um, will we ever see you again around the city county building? Uh, you can when, say maybe. Yeah, no, I was going to say like when I'm much, much older, when I'm, when I'm an ornery old guy. I'm and you're looking for the tax office? No. Just rifling through papers in the, the blue bag? This is like, I'm thinking like, I'm going to have like a pet squirrel at that time. <laughs> I'm going to be like coming into council meetings and just like causing all sorts. You're going to be an outside agitator. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but way, 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 way later. Yeah. Um, do you have a good piece of advice for Mayor Elect Ganey? I'm going to leave it for him. Uh, there is a tradition where the one mayor writes a note 
and leaves it in the desk for the next mayor. I have, um, I called him on election night. In fact, we talked about it when we met um, a few weeks ago and he had no idea. He had no, he said, when you called me, I was convinced you had already won. And, you know, we just had some additional people at the polls and knew what the numbers were going to be and just had determined that there was no way because of the turnout and where it had turned out and where people had come out in very, very large numbers. Uh, and these were the areas that he had won uh, considerably uh, that we would not make the difference up. And um, so I gave him some advice that night, which um, uh, it was, was not really advice, but just a, a congratulatory um, uh, sentiment. And then when we sat down uh, a few weeks ago, we, we sat down personally, just he and I in the office while the staff met around this table. And we talked for nearly an hour. And, um, you know, he, he was curious about it, you know, just, you know, what's, what are the good parts, what are the bad parts, and s sort of the stuff that you're asking about, but really getting a little bit more into the details. And um, I gave him just uh, really a heartfelt sentiment, but it's going to be different for him. And, and I told him that. I said, you will be judged differently because you will be the first black mayor. And I said, and, and he, he understood what I was saying. There will be people who will judge him and give him a little bit more room, and then there will be those that will judge him harshly. And, and he knew that. He will have a much harder time than I because he is not only a husband, but he is a father. And his responsibilities will be much harder than a bachelor in being able to keep both the responsibilities of the office and the responsibilities of a family. And we, we went into a little bit of that, that discussion and then we just started talking about the job itself. And you can't compare it to a city council member or a state rep. They are completely different industries. And we, we went into that and what to expect of yourself and then what to expect of your staff and how to delineate and be able to trust your staff to be able to do the job. It seems like to me uh, all politicians are judged much more harshly than perhaps ever before. Uh, and Mayor Ganey will have his share of inquisitors and people who are not on his side. There were already protesters outside his house a couple of weeks ago and he's not even mayor yet. Yeah. Um, so it's a good time to get out in, in that sense. It absolutely is. It, I, I, the, the world that I entered into politics in, in the late 1980s and the early 90s is gone. It's gone. Uh, I have a friend who, who put it very succinctly. We have become hardwired to binary decision making, meaning that if you like this, you must hate this. If, if you like this, you can't like this, or you can't even say that there's a couple of good ideas about this because then you, you're a sellout. Or, or you might as well just like this because we don't want you anymore. You know, it's, it's you, you have to, if you like Ford, you must hate Chevy. If you use a Samsung, you must hate Apple. You know, it's, it's, it's in, and it permeates down into politics where everything has become polarized. And then on the extremes on the left and on the right, it is the extremes that are dri driving the, the discussion. And the extremes are creating these litmus tests. And if you don't meet every part of the litmus test, then you're not real. And these extremes are impossible to govern by. They're impossible. You cannot govern by extremism nor by phil philosophy. You have to govern by reality. And it's not healthy. And w what you start to see is the bending of the arc, where the extremes then start to be able to have commonality. And where the commonality is, we hate the establishment. 
we hate you know these different things that are the power and where the the the, the commonality of the far left and the far right start to melt together and that's <laughs> that is where the danger is was that a weird journey for you because you were once the progressive outsider the establishment was uh, more conservative and less progressive and you were the upstart I, and then suddenly you're you're the the man the the bad man because you're the establishment I, well that happened all across the country right yeah. it was all of my fellow mayors who became the bad person bill de blasio working families number one supporter you know and the the farthest left uh mayor of new york city is now considered like Donald Trump. I mean, it's like uh, Eric Garcetti in L.A., uh, Lori Lightfoot, you know, in uh, in Chicago. I mean, these were all the the progressive leaders. The the whole movement of 2013 across the United States with all of us when we were elected mayor was written about nationally as the progressive movement and the progressives who have taken over America were the mayors, and it was less than 10 years later, and we, they were outside of our house, and in some cases, like Sam Licardo, trying to get inside of our house. Uh, and it wasn't that they were attacking the right. It was the left attacking the left in an election year for president, all in the same week. And I'm convinced that that was not a coincidence, that there was somebody who is behind that, pushing that through social media to divide the Democratic Party before the election. And there were a number of coincidences that happened during the Black Lives Matter protests that divided the left, and I think purposefully so. So I would take you one step further when you say, you know, you were the progressive. Between 2000 and 2010, politically in Allegheny County, I would say that my candidacy and the political group that I put together led the progressive movement in Allegheny County. And because of that, Bruce Krauss, Daniel Lavelle, uh, Natalia Rudiak at the time, uh, up and down the ticket, every progressive candidate, we got behind to support and help. And I'm not saying that it was because of us that they were elected, but I'm saying we were in the organization. Uh, Aaron Mulchaney, uh, it, it was state representatives and city council candidates that up and down the ballot, we won those races. And it was Matt Merriman Preston, who was the architect, who created the database and then had the information. And it was a few hundred people who would write the checks to help a progressive slate of candidates to win against the political machine. And we were able to take apart the machine bolt by bolt and to build the progressive era within the city of Pittsburgh, that then this new progressive group had a foundation to run on. So if you take me back 10 to 12 years, and you know, back in the day of the Ravenstall administration and the old city council, and say when we were sit on your show, hey, you're gonna be the next mayor. And not only that, but you're going to end up losing to the first black mayor in the city of Pittsburgh who's going to be even more progressive under a more progressive slate than you are on. I don't I never would have predicted that. No, but if we had a modicum of part of that and, and you would be able to say a small part of what you're gonna do is actually gonna create that, I'd say I'll make that trade. Uh, let me get back to your legacy. Is there one accomplishment uh, about which you are most proud? <laughs> Every single interview asked me that, and I hate that question. Oh, I've never pretended to be original. <laughs> so, no, I, I just, there's so much we did. We, you know, I, I, I mistakenly, uh, a couple of interviews ago, said there's, a, there's hundreds of things that we've done. There's hundreds of programs and projects we created that will last beyond 
our time in this office. I was wrong. There are thousands. I mean, you can take one little pixel of city government, like recycling, and you can find five or six different accomplishments that we hear. We didn't have blue garbage cans. We, right. we, we've, we've been able to get grant money to convert our, our trucks to electric trucks so they're not spewing diesel fuel into your kids' lungs when they come into your neighborhoods. You know, we, we work with the Teamsters to build out a new contract that if you look at their union, is the best contract the Teamsters got throughout all of the different parts. I mean, I, I can't pick, like, we built the largest park in the city of Pittsburgh's history. But within parks, we also have created a whole stormwater management program that we're working with the University of Pennsylvania to employ underserved communities and hire the people in order to be able to create that stormwater management program, to be able to create green areas throughout our city neighborhoods in order to be able to have less flooding. I mean, every part of city government, even to the parts where when we didn't have the capacity to do what we needed to do, we created entirely new departments. The Department of Innovation and Performance, the Cable Bureau, we overhauled it and invested millions into getting it into the 21st century. You're paying these photographers millions of dollars? No, but the equipment that they oh, have it is, nice. is all yeah. state of the yeah. art. Good they point. actually have a state of the art studio for the first time and the ability to do incredibly great things which increase the, their capacity to produce more than they've ever been able to produce. Um, we created a Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. We created, uh, I'm trying to think of all the departments we created, but the, the idea is in those eight years, trans, the transformation was we took a city government that was basically the same as the city government of David Lawrence and we built a city government in order to be able to meet the challenges of today. Pittsburgh changed during the 2000 to 2010 era, but its government didn't. And what we did from 2014 to 2022 is we changed city government. Uh, so, as you've made clear during this conversation, you're big on green energy, you're worried, always been worried about climate change. As society hopefully decides to take climate change more seriously as time goes on, do you think you'll be viewed less harshly regarding bike lanes? <laughs> bike lanes. <laughs> Is it, so, uh, I asked a friend, you know, because he brought up bike lanes and I was, I was talking to him and we were doing like that goodbye, not goodbye conversation. And, um, and they're like, how, did, how the hell did it bike lanes? I go, we spent like far less than one tenth of one percent of the budget on these things, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, bike lane Billy, you know. It's like, <laughs> and he said, you know, it's better than Mr. Peduto Head, eh, potentially, yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's it's the, okay. Number one, it's a cultural issue, right? Uh, it's them yuppies, their bikes, them, them fancy bikes, and they're, they're riding them fancy bikes around and taking my, my road away from me. Shouldn't you have more of a Yinzery accent when you, with that rant? Mm -hmm. You've never been talked much like a Yinzer. Anyway, I distracted you, go right ahead. So that's it, it's a cultural issue. For it's sure. a cultural issue. It's, it's something that other people may never use, so they feel it's an entitlement issue. Um, there's probably a few other things, but he said to me, he said, you know the way I see it? He goes, all of a sudden Pittsburgh scene, downtown Pittsburgh scenes is different. It seems cleaner. It seems more European. It seems like a slower pace, more walkable. And now I see more people using them. I see more people walking. I see more people out like pre-pandemic and the city seemed more vibrant when we had them and pre-pandemic and i explained that you know with that what it would be able to do is we were basically we had put into the spine system and now it was time to connect the neighborhoods 
and we, we've left that for, for Mayor Elect Ganey, and we have gone through the community meetings and we've t gotten our black eyes and our broken noses, but we've, we've put that in place and it's online and you can see it. And if he decides to follow through with it, Pittsburgh's gonna have one heck of a bike system. We came in, one of the worst cities in the United States for walking and biking. As we leave, one of the top cities in the United States for biking and walking uh, and for public transit use. Um, can we do better? Sure, and we should do better. Uh, but at that same time, I do believe that when people look back in the next 10 years, not 20 years, and they understand where we are in the crisis of climate change, then they will understand also why multimodal transportation is so important and the efficiency of buildings is so important and why having direct energy options is so important and why we put such a strong emphasis on building a resilient city that could have all of these different options built in because they're all going to be mandated into the future of cities throughout the world. Uh, is there anything you wish you had more time to work on? So much. I, I, I also have this knowledge that the job's never done. I mean, you never get to the point where it's like, it's perfect, <laughs> you know? So um, a really good friend told me that, you know, after I lost the campaign, I, I was not happy, you know? It, it's, it's not like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Lost that one. Woo. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I was I was upset. Uh, I was hurt. I was disappointed. Um, and surprised, I gather. Somewhat. Kind of saw it a little bit, you know, as I was going through. And y there's people that you've worked with, and people that you consider friends, and. You know, at first you notice that they're silent or not saying much, and you know, then you catch something that they put up on Facebook or something that they like on Facebook, and you're like, my gosh, you know, you, you were in the trenches with me 10 years ago when we were fighting for all of these different things, and now you're uh, not remembering it. And then you have this whole generation that wasn't around 10 years ago and they're basically calling you out for something that you never were and completely redefining you and there's nothing that you can do to change that and it's not like the old days where you can change someone's opinion with a television ad it doesn't work you know it's just it's it's a very different world with social media and we have to understand that so wasn't completely surprised uh, but I was in a bad place, you know, the May, June, and then in July, one friend said something to me. What she said was, Bill, I know you. It would have taken a crowbar to get you out of that office. And in the same time, over those four years, you'd have lived in the same house, You'd have driven the same car. You'd have gotten up same time, gone down to your office, had your same cup of coffee for breakfast. You know, sat with Dan Gilman for 10 minutes to get the update. Did all of the same routine that you've already done because you are in a rut that you can't get out of. You've been given a blessing that you don't even know. The next four years, you can do anything you want in life. Do something with these years that you would not have done with your life. Excellent advice. Are, are there any opportunities for more just fun, like more hockey games? I know you went to the Rolling Stones concert, more concerts. So that was my last time with my brother, the Stones show. No kidding, I was at that same show. Really, I didn't realize that. He came up to me at the one point in the show and he, he had been struggling at that point and it was, it was rough uh, to be there with him because I, I could see how weak he had become and 
we lost him um, 26 days later on my birthday, um, 24 days later. And he just put his arms around me from behind and he just held me and he just said, I love you. And I knew, I, I just knew right at that moment, uh, this will be probably the last time that I have uh, the opportunity to be with him. I probably won't be with him at Christmas. But yeah, uh, definitely more music once we get past uh, Omicron. Um, uh, definitely just more being able to walk the street, get a cup of coffee and be with friends uh, and definitely slowing my life down. Um, you know, I think that once you hit 60, that option is not optional. Uh, but uh, I just uh, have been, as you and I would understand, living the life of uh, 45 RPM uh, for a little bit too long, and I need to go back to being a 33. That's really depressing, but probably true. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. So I, I'm not trying to be inappropriate here, but uh, I recently consulted a therapist. You just lost three loved ones in an election. Have you considered therapy? I have. I haven't in my life. Um, I mean, it's uh, anybody that knows me would probably see it. You know, I, I with the way that I go with ups and downs. It's probably not too far stretched to, to see that I, I, I struggle or deal with uh, parts of depression. Um, sure, as we all do. Yeah. And um, I've basically taken care of that through myself and by understanding who I am. Um, but I think it's probably time as I make that transition into the next phase to be able to get a fresh start. And, you know, I know some really great docs uh, that I've had the opportunity to meet throughout my, uh, my time, even before being mayor, that uh, I would really appreciate their knowledge in being able to deal with it. You know, it's uh, uh, like my sister-in-law had said to me too, she's like, you know, you you're you're very strong and and i i put that strength uh to faith um i'm not devout when it comes to religion but i am extremely strong when it comes to spiritual faith uh, and i do believe in god um so that part has always held me in a very strong position but at the same time you cannot suppress um, and uh, I have, and it's been the work that has gotten me through the, uh, uh, the intensity, but you have to understand that during the same time of was losing my mother, my two brothers, and the election, I dealt with the collapse of PWSA. I dealt with Tree of Life. I dealt with the pension fund collapse. I, I dealt with Act 47. You know, I've been dealing with all of these crises one after another. I dealt with three alligators in like one summer. I'd forgotten that. Yes, I haven't. A steel bridge burning, 900 Civil War cannonballs in Lawrenceville. Uh, other than that, not much of anything. Falling yeah, a into sinkhole. a sinkhole. <laughs> I mean, it was uh, a cacophony. And that was kind of lucky, though, that nobody was hurt. Bus falls into a sinkhole and nobody gets you know, hurt. You know how lucky we were. I mean, it was sitting on an electrical line that had that line broke. It would have been a tr tragic, tragic event. And under that electrical line was a massive cable line of telecommunication that would have wiped out like all cable operations, telecommunications. Beautiful table, wonderful, and this is, I'll miss this table. I often would think when I'd sit around it, this is where David Lawrence used to sit. And you can imagine all the ashtrays back along those days. And this is where Sophie and Dick Caligiuri sat and all the others, um, but they didn't have 
sinkholes that ate buses. All true. Um, wow, I just, I feel like your, your head just must be spinning. No, you know, it's somebody asked me the other day some question about some obscure zoning law. And I started trying to remember back to, you know, a, a case. And I just stopped and I said, you know, I have at that point, I think it was 17 days, 17 days till I turn into a pumpkin. And I'm not even going to expend the energy at this point to try to remember that. And I just think about how much of that over the past 30 years of stored away in all of the obscurities of city code and everything else and how much space I'm going to have to free up up here as I start clearing out all the space that I've given to uh, um, obscure information about uh, the city. What I don't want to lose are the memories, um, the people, or um, any of the history. There's a, you know, if I were to write a book during the next year, uh, it would be called Through These Eyes. And it would be the story of the comeback of the city of Pittsburgh from the kid who uh, uh, lived next door to Lowell McDonald, who played for the Pittsburgh Penguins and got to grow up playing Little League with Roberto Clemente Jr. Uh, to, yes. the, Go ahead. to the guy who uh, became the mayor of the city of Pittsburgh. Are you thinking about writing that book? That sounds like a hell of a book. It's be an amazing book, but I'm looking forward to sitting around drinking coffee. Okay. <laughs> so, so I guess it all depends on how good the coffee is. Will it be so much fun when you look out the window and it's snowing and you're like, I don't care. I don't care. I said this a thousand times. Which camera am I looking at? I am going to enjoy snow so much. I am going, I'll, I'll be like playing Christmas music in March. Snow angels in the front oh lawn. Oh my God. I'm, I'm going to open up all my blinds, like sit there with my phones calling people, you know, <laughs> and just saying, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. I used to love snow as a kid. I, so I went to Chartier's Valley High School. I used to sit there listening to KDK radio, eating my cereal. It'd be like, Chartier's canceled. Chartier's Houston canceled. Chartier's Valley, two hour delay. <laughs> oh man. So, but no, now I get to uh, become human again. Will you get together with Guy Costa and celebrate, you know, yeah, with him? That would definitely. Be huge. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. Guy, you know, he just, uh, as for fun, drives around during snowstorms. Does he seriously? Yeah. Because he doesn't have to care. I'll be driving with him. Have him pick me up. All right. Well, are there any other reflections you have just in general, just in your amazing time um, being the most powerful person in the city government, having to balance a billion different things at once? Just uh, the opportunity of a lifetime. I, uh, I think back of, uh, you know, growing up in Scott Township and um, thinking that I'd one day want to be the mayor of Pittsburgh without any uh, idea how that dream could ever happen and uh, being raised by an Italian immigrant who uh, had a second grade education and um, my grandfather and you know that would be something that he'd never think would be possible and it happened so no regrets just a lot of gratitude and uh, a lot of fond memories. So just want to thank the people that got me here. I was going to say, is there anything you'd like to say to the people of Pittsburgh by looking in the lens? And just thank you. Thank you for giving me your trust and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, out and about. Uh, well, as you know, I'm a fan and I think you have a tremendous legacy and a lot to be proud of. And I think you're getting out while the getting's good and good for you. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thank you. Mayor Peduto, thank you so much. And that's it for this uh, program, the final City Channel interview with Mayor Peduto. I'm John McIntyre. We'll see you down the road.